Welcome to Dig, a history podcast. Today we're going to discuss alcohol consumption in early America. Alcohol was very important to early Americans, and it flowed freely throughout the colonies. Adults and children alike drank alcoholic beverages for a variety of reasons, one being that it was one of the few things that were safe to drink at the time. However, by the time of the early Republic, so roughly 1790 to 1830, Americans were consuming more hard liquor per capita than any other country in the world. So today we'll explore drinking in early America, ask why Americans drank so much, and how such drinking affected the New Republic. I'm Elizabeth. And I'm Sarah. And we're your historians for this episode of Dig. Alcohol arrived in North America with the arrival of European settlers. Except for a few indigenous nations in the Southwest that used alcohol in seasonal rituals, Native Americans did not drink alcohol. It was European settlers who introduced alcohol to North America. In 1630, the Puritans packed more beer than water onto their boats. They also brought a ton of brewing malt to make more beer once they arrived in the New World. Alcohol was very important to colonists and flowed freely in the English colonies. Adults and children drank all day, even at breakfast. Mm. People drank from sunup to sundown, and any event was punctuated by a dram of drink. English colonists of both sexes drank beer and ale. However, importing beer to America was expensive, and the ingredients were hard to find once in the colonies. Many colonial brewers got creative and made alcoholic drinks from spruce branches, pumpkin, pine, and ginger. Mmm, delicious. Later, in the 17th century, brewers got better at beer making, and many households made what was called small beer, a weaker beer made by soaking grain in water that spoiled quickly because of its low alcohol content. Strong beers brewed with malt and sugar was still expensive and hard to come by. Colonists learned to make a variety of wines as well uh, from local fruits. And so these include strawberry, blackberry, and currant wines. They also made wine from dandelions, goldenrod, and vegetables. I cannot imagine a vegetable wine. Personally. Yeah, or or a goldenrod wine. There's plenty of that. I know. We There's should... plenty of that. Yeah. I was like, I've heard of dandelion <laughs> wine for sure and like strawberry wine. Yeah. Goldenrod. Hard cider was a popular drink in England, but apples were not native to New England, which is wild. I think a lot of people assume that apples are indigenous to North America because we're such an apple y nation, you know, as American mm-hmm. as apple pie, but no, they, they are not. Nope. So colonists brought apple seeds from England and promptly planted apple orchards. These orchards provided fruit to make hard cider. In fact, the children's tale of Johnny Appleseed is based on a real man. His name was John Chapman, and he was said to have been visited by an angel that told him to head out west. And to be clear, west during this time period was like western Pennsylvania and Ohio. (laughs) So we're not talking about like California. (laughs) He was an interesting character who by today's standards we would probably consider insane. He tramped around barefoot in the wilderness, singing hymns and planting apple seeds. But families living on the frontier welcomed him because the crab apple orchards he planted meant that they could make hard cider. Have you ever sung the Johnny Appleseed song? Sing it to me. I I probably have. When I was yeah. When I was in 4H, we had to sing the Johnny Appleseed song before we were allowed to eat. It was like the prayer basically and it goes oh the lord is good to me and so i thank the lord for giving me the things i need the sun the rain and the apple seed the lord is good to me (laughs) oh my gosh i yeah you know what i don't know if i ever sang it but that definitely i think i'm just thinking of like the old disney cartoons there was like a paul bunyan one and a pecos bill Mm -hmm. i think there There is an apple johnny appleseed one isn't there Mm -hmm. i don't know anyway That's very sweet, Sarah. It's very quaint. I am very sweet. 
Rum was also an important spirit to early Americans. In the triangle trade, manufactured products from England were shipped to Africa, where they were exchanged for enslaved Africans. Those Africans were taken to the West Indies, where their lives were traded for molasses. That molasses was shipped to New England distillers, where they made it into rum, which was then shipped back to England or consumed in the colonies. By 1770, America was importing 4 million gallons of rum, and they were making 5 million gallons of rum per year. Jeepers. That's a lot of rum. It is. <laughs> so we just watched Black Sails. Like, we just binged oh. Black Sails. And so, like, I was, like, really thinking about rum. Because later, you'll see in the episode, I go into a lot about whiskey. I'm like, but where's the rum? I just watched <laughs> all this pirate stuff. And so we'll explain in a minute. <laughs> okay. Many gentlemen were importing and drinking Madeira, which is a strong and expensive imported wine that was made in the Portuguese Madeira Islands off the coast of Africa. However, whiskey ultimately became the drink of the common man in America. And so why did they drink so much whiskey and very little beer, actually, uh, as we kind of move on away from the Puritans? Uh, a lot of it has to do with technology. So this is an era before refrigeration or even ice boxes. Um, whiskey doesn't spoil as easily as beer. And so if you're going to drink beer, it, it has to be freshly made and it has to be drunk rather quickly before it goes bad. Uh, additionally, people were moving around a lot. And so they needed something that was portable, something that they could put in a flask and, and carry with them. And so whiskey was perfect for this because it keeps for a long time and it packs a punch. Uh, additionally, whiskey has a warming effect and America was an agrarian nation. There were a lot of people working outside, and they believed that it was beneficial to drink alcohol while working, uh, that it would help you get your work done, essentially. And so alcohol in general was understood as nourishment and medicine. It sounds like me in college. Like I, I, th <laughs> I thought that I could read and write faster if I had had just like maybe one and a half beverages. <laughs> I don't know yeah, that it no. was necessarily true. It's certainly not true anymore because now I just am like, it's sleepy time. Yeah. Taverns were central to colonial American life. They were often the only place for people to congregate for miles around, except maybe the church. Taverns were the nerve center for official public life in the colonies. You could eat, drink, and rest at a tavern, but they were also one of the main ways that people learned what was happening in the rest of the world. The early name for taverns was Public House, which turned into the pub. At the public house, people talked with traders and travelers and developed political opinions. In many towns, the tavern would also double as the courthouse. By the eve of the American Revolution, nearly half of Boston's tavern keepers were also elected to official offices. So these tavern keepers became prominent revolutionaries. Tavern owners were uniquely situated to organize informal resistance to the colonial government. Taverns were a perfect place to learn and spread revolutionary news and great places to organize and influence militias. So basically, you had a bunch of drunken, angry patriots all in one place. <laughs> and so taverns were essentially the incubators of the revolution. In fact, one in five Sons of Liberty were drink sellers. The American Republic was a radical, grand experiment for its time. And so this was a risky venture because it expected a lot of people. In a monarchy, the duty of the people is essentially to obey. But in a republic, the citizens must participate. They needed to vote. They should follow the issues, keep abreast of the issues. They should be involved in campaigns. And so a republic asks much more of people. However, this foundational period for the new American Republic is also the high point for alcohol consumption in America. And so there's this paradox in that this is a period where political ideology said that we need an electorate where the people are committed to the well-being and common good of the country. The Republic needs its citizenry to set aside self-interest to advance that common good. Um, and so this political ideology relied on what they called virtue, uh, the ability to be level-headed and put oneself aside for the common good. 
And yet, this is also a period where people are drinking <laughs> like it's going out of style. In 1790, so roughly two years after the Constitution was ratified, Americans were drinking three and a half gallons of 90 proof alcohol per capita per year. 90 proof means about 45 percent alcohol. So we're talking about hard liquor like whiskey. Yeah. So I went into my liquor cabinet just to look. And so like my gens were all between 44 and 47 percent alcohol. Right. Um, uh -huh. In comparison, most wine is about 11% alcohol right. and beers range 4 to 7%. So so we're talking about the hard stuff. Yeah, yeah. That's, yeah, yeah you're really drinking. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So in the U.S. population, per capita means everyone, including children and babies. So these numbers <laughs> take the whole <laughs> quantity of alcohol consumed in 1790 and divide it by the total population which came out to three and a half gallons per person. Now, it's fairly safe to say that men were the ones that were drinking most of this alcohol. And we base this on documents discussing drinking at the time and general understandings of biology, right? So children, of course, couldn't, couldn't drink as much as adults. And when they did, they were often drinking small beers or lightly fermented beers and ciders. Uh, something like in Bavaria, you'd call it kinder beer. Kinder um, beer. I know. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> um, and then, of course, then by elements such as body weights and, and cultural rules of comportment, it's safe to say that women were not drinking as much as men on the whole. And so when we consider these factors, the average consumption of alcohol for a grown man in 1790 was roughly 16 gallons per year of the equivalent of 90 proof alcohol. Who boy. These early Republic numbers were higher than estimates made for the colonial period, but they continued to rise. By 1830, it was up to four gallons per capita in the U.S. or seven gallons per adult. Again, considering men were probably drinking more than women, it's probably about 18 gallons per adult male. And just to put this in perspective, Americans drink about two gallons per capita today. So the numbers we are talking about are astounding. And although many people in Europe also drank a lot during this period, it's notable that American drinking habits were, you know, rare or important enough for foreign travelers to comment on. So one English visitor said that Americans were, quote, Certainly not as sober as the French or the Germans, but perhaps, <laughs> but perhaps on the level with the Irish. Oh, my quote. goodness. <laughs> and now this was a period of intense subjugation of the Irish by the English. So yeah. this coming from an Englishman, you know, kind of equating Americans with Irishmen is is, is a severe put down. Right. Yeah. Yeah. This is an insult. Can yeah. I um just to clarify, when we say that Americans drink about two gallons per capita today, that's probably not just hard liquor though right i don't know would that inc probably include like wine and beer i would imagine I'd, i mean yeah, it doesn't matter i don't know i was just wondering because like the th that's one of the differences is that it's like right such hard liquor i didn't even like yeah. 18 gallons of very hard liquor is that's, is different uh, that's than... unfortunate and i wish i would have thought to ask that question i was as i was looking up these statistics because i would imagine you're correct because we now have refrigeration, right? And so we can keep right. a beer in the fridge um, and it's just much easier mm -hmm. and just importing is easier and we're, right. not, we're not making moonshine <sighs> in the backyard. So yeah. <laughs> right, well, it's not, not most, most of us. Oh. However, some Americans acknowledged their own heavy drinking. John Adams found it, quote, mortifying that we Americans should exceed all other people in the world in this degrading, beastly vice of intemperance. Intemperance meant drunkenness in the language of the time. And we should point out that Adams' breakfast consisted of a tankard of hard cider every day. For these early Americans, it's important to note that they were drinking steadily throughout the day, which built up a pretty strong tolerance. So although many people probably had a blood alcohol ratio that would astound us, they weren't all just like binge drinking and acting crazy. In this period, intemperant referred to somebody who basically couldn't handle their liquor. So everybody had a certain baseline of intoxication. <laughs> Yeah. And if you were intemperate, it meant that you were like really overdoing it. You were over the limit. Yeah. <laughs> 
So we do see a differentiation of class here. Um, so George Washington thought that alcohol was, quote, the ruin of half the workmen in this country. But it wasn't just workmen who were drinking heavily. It was also gentlemen. So, for example, in 1790, the governor of New York, George Clinton, gave a public dinner in honor of the French ambassador. The guest list consisted of 120 gentlemen. In all, this party of 120 consumed 135 bottles of Madeira, 36 bottles of port, 60 bottles of beer, and approximately 15 bottles of rum at this one dinner alone. That's like more than one bottle of wine per person. <laughs> like, Definitely that's... more than one bottle of Madeira per person. Plus all, the Plus other all the other stuff. That's pretty impressive. Um, I, I did not ever work like in the service industry, so I couldn't say like what um, would be, you know, if you were planning like a banquet today, mm, what the, but yeah. I bet that it's probably, they probably budget like half a bottle of wine per person or something. I don't know. I mean, that would be like two drinks per person. Right. Yeah. <laughs> too, 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 too big, too big. Two Sarah sized uh, glasses of wine. <laughs> My husband brought me up a glass of wine the other night. I was upstairs with the baby and he, he, he had offered to bring it up to me and he handed it to me and I was like, really? That's it? Like, <laughs> like, go back down. People were drinking everywhere and for all occasions. They drank at taverns. They drank at work. They drank at weddings and they drank at funerals. They drank to celebrate and they drank to numb the pain. Many people drank from sunup to sundown, with many men imbibing in what was known as an eye opener. This was a shot of whiskey, rum, or gin mixed with bitters, and then they would continue to drink throughout the rest of the day. A British naval officer and novelist said, quote, The Americans can fix nothing without a drink. If you meet, you drink. If you part, you drink. If you make acquaintance, you drink. If you close a bargain, you drink. They quarrel in their drink, and they make up with a drink. They drink because it is hot. They drink also because it is cold. If successful in elections, they drink and rejoice. If not, they drink and swear and begin to drink early in the morning. They leave off late at night. They commence it early in life and continue it until they soon drop into the grave. (laughs) <laughs> Nothing has been more accurate. So why were Americans drinking so much during the New Republic? One reason is that the water quality still wasn't very good. There was almost nothing in the way of public purified water at the time. If you lived near a town or a city, you might get your water from a common well, but this meant traveling sometimes up to a few miles in order to get your daily water. So water wasn't something that you'd want to waste on a silly thing like drinking it, right? (laughs) Not to mention, uh, I'm sure you can only imagine how filthy those public water spots could get, especially in a larger city. Um, And so if you were able to get your water, say, from a nearby river or stream, you better make sure that you were upriver from any larger settlements as waterways doubled as sewers. So needless to say, drinking water was not the first option for many people. Mm -hmm. Uh, Just as a side note, have you ever read that article? And I apologize that I can't remember who wrote it. I'll have to look it up and maybe I can put it in the show notes or something. But there's a a brilliant article that doctors that um, Eric Seaman assigns in his Death in America class about um, like the just stunning death rates in the colonial Chesapeake, how pe- you know people were just dying at like intensely oh. insane rates. And this this historian did all of this research and found that they were not only drinking like brackish seawater in the Chesapeake Bay region, but they also were drinking their own waste because of like the ecology of the the way that the water works in this area it wasn't yeah it flushing wasn't it out washing yeah exactly. it wasn't washing out to sea and so i actually have read that article yeah they um found that that mortality rates improved when people started planting apple trees because then they started making hard cider and drinking that instead of drinking the water so like america yeah. was literally founded <laughs> Like the reason that that Virginia was successful at all was because of booze, which I think is just really great. Yeah. 
Uh, anyway, alcohol was very inexpensive. During the 1720s and 1730s, the price of a gallon of rum in Boston fell from three shillings sixpence to two shillings, making it affordable for even the lowest paid workers. By the end of the century, American distilleries produced five million gallons of rum a year, in addition to the four million gallons that they imported. Whiskey was cheap in the United States because people were mostly consuming domestically produced alcohol. Whiskey is made from grain, and Americans grew a ton of grain. America was the number one grain-producing country in the world, so they had a lot of surplus grain. Often, the grain growers were at a distance from the markets where they would sell those grains. For example, if they were in western Pennsylvania and they had to get their produce over the mountains to the market in Philadelphia, they needed something that was more portable and higher value per volume. Like, it was just really difficult to, like, transport big, you know, amounts of <laughs> corn over the right. Appalachian Mountains, right? So distilling their crop into whiskey made it much more marketable in the East and just easier to move. <laughs> this mm -hmm. meant that there was more whiskey being produced in the United States than in any other country in the world. And since there was such a high supply, the price was very low. By 1810, whiskey far outpaced rum as the national drink. Another factor that made alcohol so inexpensive was that governments didn't tax whiskey. So today, if you go to the liquor store and you pick up a bottle of whiskey, it, it's not going to be very cheap. You're probably not going to walk, walk out of there spending under at least $30, right. probably more. definitely. Right? Um, a lot of that cost is going to state and federal taxes. But in the 18th and early 19th century, there was no tax on alcohol but whiskey in particular and so you had a very common product with virtually no taxation on it and so it was cheaper to get drunk in america than in any other country in the world <laughs> and many americans begin to feel that that was one of their primary liberties the federal government actually tried to tax whiskey in the early republic it did not go so well. In 1791, in an attempt to recoup some revolutionary war debt, Alexander Hamilton and the federal government put a 25% excise tax on whiskey. Many on the frontier saw the tax as favoring larger whiskey producers based in the East, as well as being an affront to their very way of life. Collectors sent to collect the tax on the whiskey were harassed. Robert Johnson, a Western Pennsylvania tax collector, was assaulted by a group of 16 men dressed as women. He was beaten, stripped, shaved, tarred, and feathered. Which we think that of tar and feathering as like kind of like a funny thing, but like it sucked. Tar is it's awful. Like it's hot it's ho and it burns. It the could kill out of you. you. Yeah. Yeah, there's a good, <clears throat> excuse me, the John Adams, HBO yes. John Adams special. I think it's in the first or the second episode. You see somebody get tarred right. together. And I think it really, like, seeing it visually, not just on a oh, right. drawing, you know, but, like, see it on somebody. Like, can you, I mean, I can't even imagine being dipped in right. tar. Right. For some reason, I think like, the... the um, cartoons and illustrations from this time period always show people just kind of like sitting there covered in chicken feathers or something yeah, but it, like oh like, crap yeah exactly but it, <laughs> like no their skin is like literally burning right, it sucks you know and then picking it off Ugh. so mm. this poor tax okay. collector uh you know yes. was not was not doing so hot Tensions peaked in 1794 when Federal Marshal David Lennox and John Neville served summons to more than 60 distillers who had evaded the whiskey tax. After they arrived at the home of William Miller to serve a summons, an argument broke out and shots were fired. An angry mob began to form. In the coming days, a group of rebels who were against the tax swelled to over 7,000 men. On September 25th, 1794, President George Washington led 12,000 members of the Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Maryland, and Virginia militias to quash the insurrection. What came to be known as the Whiskey Rebellion was substantially important because it marked the first time that the national government exerted military control over American citizens, all over attacks on whiskey. Yeah, this was a big deal. Other reasons Americans drank so much had to do with America's propensity to travel. Americans were moving around in pursuit of economic opportunity, and they weren't always finding it. 
When they moved, either to trade or to push westward, they were forming new social bonds with people. It was a custom to share a drink with a new acquaintance. Almost every social occasion featured drinking. The local corn husking, barn raising, funeral, marriage. There was even a special brew for birthing. Another factor is what Americans ate. Their diet was very heavy on meat, but without refrigeration, meat had to be preserved with salt or it was smoked. And in both of these cases, if you eat a lot of meat like that, you're going to be thirsty, right? Salty meat meats you want to drink, <laughs> right? And so back then, your choices were water, which was probably pretty nasty, or whiskey. And most people chose whiskey or some other form of alcohol. And so there was this belief that after you had a heavy meal of salted or smoked meat, that you need alcohol to settle your stomach. Yeah, you gotta have your, you gotta have a glass of bourbon to go with your barbecue. <laughs> Which you sounds go. pretty good to me right now. <laughs> Americans were notorious for eating massive quantities of food and eating it as quickly as possible. European visitors were just astonished at American eating habits. They would just marvel to see these huge quantities of hams and bacon being scarfed down in five minutes. And then they had to settle their stomachs with whiskey. One European noted, quote, as soon as food is sat on the table, they fall upon it like wolves in an unguarded herd. God, we sound like animals. <laughs> there was also belief that alcohol helped people work outdoors and helped them deal with extremes of temperature. Most Americans worked outside because this was an agrarian country. 80% of Americans were farmers. Other common occupations were also outdoors, so like logger or fishermen. Relatively few Americans worked indoors at desk jobs. But even those who did work inside, say like a shopkeeper, also drank on the job because they believed that it helped people do their daily work. It was a common practice and practically universal understanding that employers would provide their workers alcohol. So if you were a farmer and you hired farm laborers, those laborers expected that in addition to the pay you were going to give them, that you were also going to give them a meal and you were going to provide them with alcohol. Mm -hmm. If you went into a shoemaker shop, it would be the same story. The master would provide alcohol. It would be a bond between the master and the journeyman or apprentice, and it would keep the work going. Uh, workmen digging the Erie Canal were paid in part with whiskey. So in addition to their daily ration, they were also given whiskey in lieu of cash. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's it reminds me, too, of like the the tradition within the, the navies that grog was part of the deal. Like you. Yeah, because that's what you need to survive. Right, Like you ha were guaranteed a certain amount of rum or grog, you know, to, to get you through. And if <laughs> the if your captain was not holding up their end of the bargain, that could become a really dangerous situation. It could that's literally lead to mutiny. mutinies. Yeah. 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 Enslaved people were not allowed to have alcohol with an exception made during harvest seasons. Harvest was a special time. And so as an incentive to get slaves to work harder during the harvest, some masters did provide alcohol. However, enslaved people saw free people all around them drinking very heavily. It was a natural state and a priority of being a free person in the New Republic. So it became a goal to steal alcohol and share it with your friends in the slave quarters as an act of defiance. Elections were also punctuated by extreme alcohol drinking. So, you know, we'd like to think that Americans in the New Republic were sober when making very <laughs> important decisions, but they were not. Friends and supporters of different candidates hung out at the polling places or at taverns, giving potential voters copious amounts of alcohol while telling them to vote for their candidate. Uh, an account from 1830 noted, quote, an election in Kentucky lasts three days, and during that period, whiskey and apple toddy flow through our cities and villages like the Euphrates through ancient Bab Babylon. <laughs> of course, today we have laws that say that you must be a certain number of feet away from a polling station, and you're not allowed to press whiskey on people and then carry them into the polls when they when they're, uh, you know, good and saucy. But there weren't any laws like that in the early republic. There are a bunch of stories of um, people like specifically finding like bums 
or like, you know, bar flies and getting them hammered and then literally, as you say, carrying Carrying them them to to the the polls polls, and making them vote for their candidate. So like this was a thing. (laughs) And also many of the polling places were in the tavern. Uh-huh. Like the tavern was the central place. So that's where so it was. Convenient. So it's like very convenient. Yeah, you just get sloshed and then you just stumble over. Oh, and this is also before the secret ballot. Right. So, you know, they could just stand there. They basically take you to the right box, you know? Yes. Yeah. Right. Uh, so, so what were some of the social consequences of this level of alcohol consumption, particularly by men? So remember, alcohol consumption peaked in the 1830s. And so social strains began to develop as the American economy and social structure changed. This period is often called the market revolution by historians because the economy and the ways that people worked began to drastically change. The workplace was moving away from the home and into mills and factories. No longer was the home the sole site of production, but now many people were beginning to leave their homes to go and work in these early factories. And so this put a strain on relations between employers and employees as some employers stopped providing alcohol to their employees and they tried to curtail its usage at work. The addition of machines to the workplace made these tensions worse. It's one thing if you're making shoes by hand in your workshop at home, but when you start making a shoe with machinery, you can start to lose fingers and hands and arms pretty quickly. Also, once machines became a staple of manufacturing, then the level of production was more noticeable to the employer. Production started moving at a brisker pace than people were accustomed to. Add being drunk to that mix and you've got a real problem. This is especially concerning to people who are organizing new workplaces, particularly factories. Employers in general want to get more good work out of their employees because they are engaged in a competitive marketplace. If your competitor reduces the drinking of his workers and you don't, who is going to produce more product? Well, your competitor. Another consequence of high levels of drinking was a high level of violence. Men were surrounded by other men who were drunk. They start arguing about politics, about property lines, about the weather, whatever, and fights break out. There is also a high propensity for domestic violence. Husbands beating wives, fathers beating children, masters beating apprentices. This level of heavy drinking left some Americans to question it because of these violent social problems. And women in particular Um, You know, they are not drinking as much as men, but they are bearing many of the consequences. So one negative consequence could be poverty. If your husband is drinking up all his wages, then there's not going to be enough food or clothing for the family. So women became very concerned that a heavy level of alcohol consumption was leading to high levels of domestic abuse and impoverishing many families. The concept of Republican motherhood meant that women felt that they had an obligation to teach virtue to their children so that they could continue this grand experiment that was the U.S. But it's hard to teach virtue to your children when the patriarch of the household is drunk a lot of the time. Women argued that their responsibilities as Republican mothers meant that they should be heard in the political sphere on issues that affected their household. And they argued that the number one negative issue affecting their households was the high level of alcohol consumption. Women argued that if they were going to be the protectors of the domestic sphere, then much less drinking needed to happen in the public sphere. So the fight for temperance took on this gendered element. Additionally, evangelical religion is spreading through this period that we call the Second Great Awakening. Evangelical churches during the period of 1820 to roughly 1850 were increasingly coming to the belief that drinking any alcohol is a sin, which would lead people to other sins. So early in the colonial period, churches had tried to reduce drinking a little bit, but they hadn't really pushed on it to an extreme. But now you had churches pushing very hard, especially in this period after 1830. So elements of Republican motherhood, evangelical Christianity, and the growing marketplace and shift to industrial capitalism were all causing friction in what historian W.J. Rorabaugh labeled the alcoholic republic. 
But even with the changes from the New Republic period to the Market Revolution period, it's important to remember that America was still an overwhelmingly agrarian nation. So even though the workplace was changing, most Americans stayed farmers, and a lot of farmers were becoming evangelical Christians. In turn, they wanted to reduce alcohol consumption on moral grounds. Additionally, many factory employers were not only eliminating the alcohol they provided to workers, they were also telling their workers not to drink their own alcohol on the job. So occasionally employers, you know, went went further and they told their employees to mm-hmm. not like bring a flask in or whatever, just essentially no more drinking on the job. Some employers went even farther and insisted that if employees wanted to keep their jobs, they needed to take an oath of temperance. This developing tension not only built between those that drank and those that didn't, it also became a class divide, especially in more urban areas. Because the middle and wealthy classes were the ones who owned the factories, and they were mostly people insisting on curbing alcohol consumption. The people who were most resistant to curbing alcohol consumption were the people who felt the most need for alcohol to cope with their harder lives, the working classes. There were, of course, working men who joined in temperance societies like the Washingtonians. However, most people who cared about temperance and curbing alcohol at this time were the middle and upper class. There was also an ethnic divide in the move to curb alcohol consumption. Americans who were born in the United States, um, they called themselves natives, not to be confused with actual aboriginal people, uh, were more, so, so these nativists were more prone to embrace the temperance movement than were immigrants. And immigrants often felt that the temperance movement was a form of cultural and religious warfare against them. Many of the immigrants to America uh, were Catholics, and so they didn't quite see the same problems with alcohol that Protestants were identifying. And so these Catholics felt that attempts to reduce their alcohol consumption was a way of attacking their ethnicity and their faith. This all transpires in a political divide. There was a new pair of political parties operating in the 1830s and 40s. The old Federalists were gone. The Jeffersonian Republicans had changed and evolved. And so the parties at play during this period were the Democrats and the Whigs. The Whigs drew very heavily upon those social groups that favored temperance. It was a party strong in the Northeast, strong among business owners, and strong among evangelical Christians. So, naturally, it embraced temperance. The Democrats, on the other hand, drew support from those who tended to be against alcohol reform. So immigrants, the working class, and rural Americans. The cultural divides over alcohol had political consequences. During the 1830s and 40s, most temperance organizations began to call for total abstinence from all alcohol instead of just a decrease in consumption. It is also during this period that temperance groups started to have a real impact on drinking levels in the United States. They initially achieved change through moral suasion, which uh, basically persuades people to move to make the, a choice themselves to change their behavior. It essentially became disrespectful to be a middle class person and to be a heavy drinker. In response, drinking levels decreased among the middle class, particularly in the Northeast and the Midwest. It was no longer fashionable or proper to be a drinker in some middle class circles. But drinking among immigrants and the working class was still, on the whole, acceptable behavior. However, temperance groups were finding that there was a cap as to how far they could go to achieve a reduction in drinking if they just relied on moral suasion. So the alternative was to get localities and states to pass laws that would forbid the sale, consumption, and production of alcohol. And there were a number of states that did take up this question of whether they should ban alcohol entirely. The first state to do this was the state of Maine. In 1846, Maine passed the first statewide law in the United States prohibiting the sale of alcoholic beverages. Only alcohol made for industrial or medicinal use could legally be sold, making alcohol the first prescription medicine. Maine passed a second law in 1851, which strengthened the restrictions on alcohol. During the next four years, northern states adopted their own version of the Maine law. All the New England states adopted similar laws, as did New York and about half the states in the Midwest. 
No southern states passed temperance laws, which highlights how the country was dividing over the issue of temperance and particularly over the attempt to use political prohibition to force people to change their behavior. There were a few reasons for this. The South didn't have as many factories as the North did. Also, the South didn't attract immigrant populations like the North. The South was still a very rural, agrarian part of the country. Additionally, there was also a developing suspicion about the North and any kind of social movement that developed there. That's not to say there weren't Southerners who favored temperance. There were. There just weren't enough of them to pass any laws. These so-called Maine laws that swept through the Northeast and parts of the Midwest caused a lot of social chaos. Immigrants saw these laws as a bold-faced affront against their religion and their culture. In many ways, these temperance laws became about racism, not about alcohol. When an anti-Catholic know-nothing party member was elected as the mayor of Chicago and tried to close taverns on Sundays and increase the cost of liquor licenses, the city erupted in a riot known as the Lager Beer Riots. Courts began striking down these prohibition laws in the late 1850s. If they weren't struck down completely, they were greatly weakened. And so the fire and passion of the early temperance movement died down throughout the 1850s and 60s. And it wasn't until the 1870s that the temperance crusade started up again with a fervor, spurred on by a woman's crusade in the Women's Christian Temperance Movement, or the WCTU. And you can hear more about that movement uh, in our episode for Heart and Hearth and the Rights of Women, Radical Christianity in Pursuit of Conservative Ends in the 19th Century. Wow, that was a title. I should have probably redone that title. <laughs> but basically, it talks about like... Uh, women's work in the WCTU in, mm-hmm. in the 1870s, right? Mm-hmm. And and I guess, really, we probably should also, now we have an early kind of alcohol um, episode, and then we have that one about the WCTU, so maybe mm-hmm. eventually we'll do one about, like, the Prohibition, the 18th yeah. Amendment and Prohibition that's a good point. Of, the, we've, of the 20th century. We've never done anything on Prohibition, and that's, yeah. it's a, it's a, issue that I don't actually know a great deal about. And I always have students um, writing papers in my historical writing class, which focuses on local history. They're always writing about like beer brewing in Buffalo, and they always have sections on prohibition. Mm -hmm. And I never have like, I I never feel like I have quite enough context to like help them in those sections. Mm. So I would love to do a prohibition episode sometime. Okay, well, I'll put that on my on my list. (laughs) So, so yeah, so that's, that's kind of it for this, for this, uh, alcoholic republic as, uh, Rohrbach calls it. So, um, yeah, we were drinking a lot. (laughs) I had to read this book, um, in college, actually, I took a class called the decade and it was a class that was like, um, different professors would teach at different semesters and you it was always just like a toss up like what decade you oh, would get depending fun. on which which history professor was teaching it and i was like oh i i know that my advisor taught it on the 60s and i really wanted to take that but it, <laughs> when i en- en- enrolled in the class it ended up being taught by a different professor and it was the 1830s mm. and i thought oh god this is going to be so boring and it turned out to be probably one of my favorite classes I'm i've sure. ever taken 1830s and are part amazing. of it was because they are amazing. Part of it was because of this book, um, Rorabah's The Alcoholic Republic, because it was just so wild. I, I You never learn about like the, how intense the alcohol consumption was in the United yeah. States. Yeah. So. And how tied it was to politics and oh, all of this stuff. Everything. So I, I very much enjoyed revisiting. Good. Well, I'm glad you enjoyed it. Indeed. All right, go go get a lager beer, and uh, we'll see you in the next series. Okay, or the next episode. Bye, or whatever. Should we should we do Wait, all the? Do we have stuff? to sign off? <laughs> Remember to leave us a five star review. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and join our history uh, Facebook group, History Pod Squad, on Facebook. Mm-hmm. 
Um, yep. Um, if you are teaching with podcasts, we have a section on our website for educators that has all sorts of different lesson plans. Uh, we also have full transcripts for every episode, except for some of our very, very old ones. Um, and those are, are really useful in the classroom as well. And, um, you know, if you want to get in touch, tell us about how you're using the podcast in the classroom. We would love it. You can email us at hello at digpodcast.org. If you have a particularly you know, interesting lesson plan you want to pass along, let us know and maybe we can put that on the website to help other educators as well. Uh, yeah, and I think that's it. Thanks for listening. Yes, go drink some grog. <laughs> Bye. Farewell. Um, relatively, uh, the Republican needs its citizenry. Citizenry. Wait, to you set said, aside. I'm sorry, you said the Republican. Okay. <laughs> I kind of messed that up. The South was still a very rural, 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 rural. Alexander Hamilton and the federal government put a 25% excise task on whiskey. Oh, Aham. Many. Tax. You said task. What did I say? Task? You said task. Oh, God. Yeah. Friends and supporters of different candidates. Candidates. Whoops. Strong beers, beard with malt and sugar, was still expensive. Oh. Strong beard beers. with beard. <laughs> Beer me. <laughs> but even with the changes from the new Republican peer. Oh, my God. Alcohol was very expensive during the 1720s and 1730s. Was not. Oh, was not very expensive. OK, was very inexpensive. Oh, I'm sorry. You said okay. expensive. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, I was recording a lecture the other day and the and the ice cream man came by. <laughs> And I think I was talking about like the the the, part, the worst part of the depression, oh, and then no. all of a sudden the dee, ice cream dee, man goes, dee, dee. Yeah. and I'm like, oh, this doesn't fit. But I am not re-recording. <laughs> all right. Uh, it in, it <laughs> it ascent. Um, my thing won't scroll down, so I don't know what my last. Uh, that was it. Sentences. Oh, is it there just one says more sentence. So you say it. You say the last sentence. No, that was your sentence. It all you. The only thing you didn't say was, "That's all for us today." <laughs> <laughs> you've you've watched Shit's Creek, correct? I have not. I'm oh not my the god! Last on Earth, who's not watched it? Yet. My favorite episode is this one where Moira gets a job, um, reading like be appearing in a commercial for a local fruit wine manufacturer, but they keep making her sip the wine while she's recording and so she keeps she's getting drunker and drunker and by the time <laughs> she finally records it she can't pronounce the guy's name so she just keeps going herb gerblinger schnerv bird earner and like coming up with different versions of his name is hysterical <laughs> anyway go on <laughs> vegetable wine nice okay well uh, this is you <laughs>